to James Acaster. <laughs> I've noticed he's brought out another podcast, which is basically him chatting to some other comedians. Yeah. It's an easy way to do it, isn't it? <sighs> Are we all comfortable? Do we all have a drink? Are we all ready? Oxo on the ready. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. Okay. Um, so the reason I asked, well, I asked um, Adam if, it was a, if, if, if he thought this was a good idea because I'm a massive supporter of independent podcasts, obviously true crime. Um, and I have worked within digital marketing for the last, God, I don't know how long now, 10, 12 years. Um, so we were kind of teaching Twitter before Twitter ever became a thing. And um, where we are based in Wakefield, we were kind of the leading way in how to build an online marketing strategy. So we worked with a whole myriad of customers. And our, our goal the whole time was, it doesn't matter how many followers, how many fans, how many likes, how many shares you get, what, what turns it into cold hard cash? I'm a Jewish girl, what can I say? We, we're driven by money. Um, <laughs> so every single objective that we ever had around um, digital marketing was all about how can we turn that into cash? And what I see is, and what I hear in the true crime community is that you have your Patreon sites and some of you maybe have a little bit of merchandise as well. Um, and I, I know from personal experience of running a podcast that the time, the effort, the energy, the amount of resources that you put into doing your research, then writing, recording, editing. Oh my God. If you worked it out per hour, you'd be earning less than a penny. It's, you know, it's, and um, Adam reached out to me as a moderator on the UK True Crime Group and asked us if we had any marketing strategies. And I was like, yes, I do. I do. I do. <laughs> I said, a great long list. Um, and we slowly worked through it. We, we've turned, we've had a little bit of success so far. So, you yeah. know, quite a long way to go. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is basically the, the, the marketing strategies that A, I've helped Adam put into place and also um, marketing strategies that I put into place for other clients. So you can see in the bottom right hand corner, it says Lady Cats Digital Marketing Made Easy. And this is a company that I, I, I kind of run on and off. I run it full time up until the middle of last year and then for one reason or another, um, personal reasons, it, it kind of fell by the wayside and I turned to writing full time. But I still do kind of keep my hand in and keep up to speed with everything that's going on. Okay, so I'm just going to work through these slides. Um, if you want to stop me at any point, just kind of raise your hand because the volume's not great at this end. So if you just raise your hand and I'll stop and answer. And then when we get to the end, I'll, um, I'll answer any more questions that you might have forgotten. And Karen, I thought this might be really good for you because you've got an online shop. Mm -hmm. so everything that I'm saying applies to you as well. So you don't think it's just for podcasters. You can apply it to practically any service, any service based business. Okay. this. Thank you. No worries. So, Catherine, before you, before you carry on, should I just jump in? Yeah. Last month with um, with Catherine's advice, I increased my Patreon um, by 16 people, which for me is amazing. So I usually lose 16 a month. So I'm um, just doing some <laughs> basics. Real. I'm convinced. Yeah, I'm a good person to know, Adam. Sorry. I really am, despite <laughs> Um, So, before you get shocked with all the. You keep saying, Catherine. <laughs> so, that. Um, don't get shocked with all the bullet points. Um, it, it's really, it's going to, I've got about an hour, so um, we can go through it. Okay, so one of the things that comes up quite often when I'm speaking to other corporate clients or individuals um, is is email still relevant? Um, because obviously you see, and you know yourself, you get shit in your inbox every day. And it's like, oh, I mean, I've got a Google account set up literally just for junk email. And I think it's sitting up like 10, 12,000 because I just don't open it, I don't read it. Um, those kind of emails are not the ones that you're looking for. You're looking for the ones that are preferably not Gmail, but I understand the kind of genre that you're in, you are gonna get those Gmail addresses. So we're gonna have a look at how you can make those more enticing so that when they land in your inbox, They've got a line in there that's really going to make people want to open it. Oh, hang on. Bob just wants to join us. Let's get Bob in. Bob. Right, give us a second. There we go. There he is. Oh, he's sat in the garden. Oh, it's all right for some. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Sorry for my lateness. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so all we talked about so far, really, Bob, is a um, little overview of who I am, where I've been, which is quite dull. Uh, and then we're just chatting about internet, about email marketing, and why it's still relevant, and how you can make the most of, and how you can get the higher open rate when it lands in somebody's inbox. That's it, really. Um, okay, so I don't know if you guys remember, but it was about this time last year, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, a massive outage. So everybody that was running adverts, that would pre-plan their marketing um, programs, that were looking to sell on these platforms, were suddenly, holy shit, what do we do now? We've got all these fans and you know customers that are waiting for us to give them some information, and it's just not working. I think it was down for about, I don't know, maybe four or five hours. But if you were to turn that into monetary value for these for these um, people that were selling the advertisers, it cost them an awful lot. They had no other way of communicating with their audience because all they had was a like or a follow, which doesn't equate to anything. So this is the reason why I advocate email marketing so much because it is commission-based, it's measurable, and it's action-oriented. So as Adam will tell you, we've changed the way that people join the UK True Crime Group and that we've said, you know, every so often we'll send you an email please pop your email address below. And I think we've had maybe 20, 30 people give us their email addresses from that, which we've then set up into an email uh, marketing program, which Adam has now managed to convert some of them into paying Patreon customers. And that's only one step in this whole process. And when I say it's permission-based, because obviously there's the GDPR and all the data protection, you, if, you, if you are asking for somebody's email address, or if you want to email them, you have to have their permission. Really, that's all it means in a very kind of small nutshell. But every email you send has to be relevant to them and it has to give them an action. And this is how you measure the effectiveness. Are we still with me? Yeah, okay. And then another thing that we're gonna to touch on is how email can be personalized as well. Okay, but where do you start? So do any of you have any email lists to start off with? Just measure around, give me a shout. Not in the chat box yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, a platform that I always used to advocate was something called MailChimp. Um, they changed their terms of trading in around about June last year um, and it stopped being free, you have to pay for it. Uh, and I'm, again, Jewish, <laughs> always go for the free version. Um, and, and I'm also, you know, I understand that you're putting a lot of time and effort into producing these podcasts and running these online businesses and you want to see a quicker return for as little outlay as possible. Um, so I found MailerLite, which I had used in um, conjunction with MailChimp. Uh, MailerLite uh, work, works equally as well. Um, I'll pop the links in the chat box so you can have a look. Um, from there, once you've signed up for an email service provider, you can then add the form to your website, you can drop it into your social media pages, you can add it onto your email sign form, into all your um, social networks. Um, and you can encourage people to start joining up. So like I said, I'm using Adam as an example, but you know, would you like to hear some behind the scenes stories from UK true crime every so often? So we don't want to email them every two or three days after that initial contact. Um, but we are going to email them every so often. Um, and some ideas, you can get a free download, so maybe it's a Patreon episode that you want to give to email subscribers, regular newsletters, so what's going on in the crime world. I mean, I know we, there's a lot of online festivals as opposed to face-to-face -to -face ones, but that's still something that you can offer them. If you've got your um, merchandise set up, you can do first order discounts, um, like free shipping and royalty cards, it's more, mostly for product stocks, but that's something that you could offer, Karen, with your crystals business, um, you, you, a loyalty card or something, if they buy the first five, they get six free, something like that. Or um, with your Patreon, you guys could do, if you, you know, um, recommend Patreon to three of your friends, then you'll get an upgrade for free. So it's just thinking a little bit outside the box and how you can, you know, to maybe give some, have a loss lead or give something for free, but you're going to get a bigger return on it in the end. Um, so segmenting your audience. Now, how we would, how, can't see okay. so how I did this when I had Herding Cats, we were, I was, well, we are a digital marketing company. So for example, if somebody had signed up to me because they wanted to learn how to use Twitter, I would put them into a segment called Twitter. 
So every time I had a newsletter that came out that was relevant to Twitter, I made sure that they got it because I knew they were interested in it. Same with Facebook, same with Instagram, same with YouTube. So that I was talking to them directly about what it was that they were interested in. So for true crime, it could be, um, I don't know, it could be serial killers, it could be UK true crime, it could be just American, London, you could do it by region. You can always add, I'm going to show you into MailerLite a little bit further on so you, you'll see what I'm talking about, but you can always add a little box and say, what are you interested in? And then it will automatically segment it off for you. But like I say, I will, I will get into that. But what you're doing all this time is you're building a relationship. You don't imagine if you build your, ail, your mailing list up to 3,000 people, you don't imagine that you're going to be emailing 3,000 people. What you are doing is emailing one person and you're having a direct conversation with that one person because that makes them feel more included, but it also helps to build that relationship. And more importantly, it's that loyalty because if they feel loyal to you, when, then whenever they see you appear, they will retweet you, they will like you, they will help you grow your reach, which will in turn help you grow your subscribers, which will in turn help you get some more money. So we're all helping each other out, but they don't need to know that. Only all they, all they need to know is that you are talking to them directly. All making sense? Yeah, you are very quiet. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is something again, marketer, I've got to set goals, otherwise how the hell do you know it's working? So think about who it is that you're targeting. Think about why you're sending them the email. What action do you want them to take? How will you track the clicks that they make? And what will the end success look like for you? So it could be that you want more Patreon subscribers. It could be that you want to sell more merchandise. So if you want more, if you set a target for June and say you want 30 more, more Patreon subscribers, how many people do you have to have on your email list to make that happen? usually about 45 to 50 percent that convert that convert if you do the email right so you need to be aiming to get 60 on your email list by the end of june for you to convert that into paying customers yeah um and think about why you're send, sending them that email so don't just send it out randomly i know quite a few of you attend when, when there are live events and you do public talks and uh, things like that so if you set out your plan and you say, I want to get 10 people onto this next talk, this next show that I'm doing live in Birmingham, for example, um, I need to make sure I've got you know, at least 30 people that I can email regularly that are gonna have a chance of signing up for me. So what is it and what action do you want them to take is super important. And this is something that I've learned over the years. Um, you have to, people are stupid. You have to tell them what you want them to do. <laughs> You have to direct them. They want my hand holding and then to be told which button to press and when. And I do I sound condescending? Yeah, because people are stupid. I mean, you really do have to just lead them by the hand. If you don't tell them what you want them to do, they won't do it. <laughs> um, which is why if ever I send any of my emails out, the, the like click here button is massive with fingers pointing in and the word big bulleted click here so they don't have an option they know exactly what it is that i want them to do i mean if you take for example when they're joining facebook groups i mean has anybody ever read a rule in a facebook group i know for definite i haven't and i know exactly how many times a day karen and i and adam as moderators have to say please don't ask for recommendations there are 50 million threads on recommendations i've even put a little thing on saying recommended tv shows people don't listen you have to tell them what you want them to do sorry off my box now, <laughs> it drives me mad. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about setting goals, now test and measure, and this is where the real strength of your strategy will come in. Yes, please don't freak out, I'm asking you to make a strategy. <laughs> um, but you have to, you have to test and measure. So you have to look at different subject lines, make it enticing. Um, there's one that I always use, uh, there's one I always use as an example, um, is, um, how to lose quick how to lose weight quickly. Nobody's gonna quick nobody's gonna click that. But if you wait, here's my here's free chocolate, somebody's gonna hate that. You're gonna get and then the email the body of the email can be you can have your free chocolate bar when you've lost 10 pounds. It's a little bit of reverse psychology, but it works. Um try asking people questions as well, asking people questions. Um when Adam did your when you did your YouTube live recently. Um, 
the great headline being used, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, people would phone, they would dial in just to watch you go wrong. I mean, that's how sick people are. They just really want to see you fail. <laughs> but if you put that as a headline, then you can get more people clicking through. I think your click through rate was about 47%. Which is uh, which is brilliant. It's unprecedented. <laughs> um, and then call to actions. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. So a call to action is um, where you're going to send people. So remember, I said you tell people what it is that you want them to do. Um, so it's basically what call to action are you going to put? What what action do you want them to take? And vary where you send people as well. So don't always send people directly to your Patreon site. Maybe set up. Um, send them to your Facebook page, to your Twitter page, to Instagram, um, something like that, and see which gets the most traction. Because you might find out that you've been spending 90% of your marketing effort on Facebook, but actually your biggest market's on Instagram. It's not a given where your audience is going to be hanging out. Um, but if you are giving people a direct action and you can then study which one got the more traction, you're going to get a better success rate all around. But if you're not testing and measuring that, how do you know? Make sense? Mm -hmm. I've just been told by the husband that I need to slow down, so I'm sorry I do talk fast. <laughs> um, and then other things, other silly things, uh, button colours. Uh, for example, don't, don't use red as a call to action button. Doesn't work. Use purple or blue. They do. Don't, use, don't ever use red in a headline. Puts people off. You're shouting at them. You're being rude. Uh, use green if you can. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how I know this shit, but I do. Um, and then look at the different dates and times that you're sending. So for the first, I would say for the first four to six weeks, and we're going to go through a schedule in a minute, so you understand what I mean. For the first four to six weeks, you may send out um, three or four emails as part of a welcome sequence, but set them for different days of the week and at different times, and you'll see a pattern. So, for example, with herding cats, when I send out an email, Thursday afternoon at three o'clock, I get a better open rate than I do Friday morning at nine, which kind of cuts the trend a bit. Um, but then with other customers, we have a better open rate. We had a better open rate at nine o'clock on a Monday morning because people are just getting to the desks and are bored and before they get their head around the day, they're having a coffee and they're flicking through their emails. But your individual success rate will be down to your individual audience, not, not every audience is going to be the same. So it's, it's about testing and measuring. Okay, next, what to say. Okay, so um, be relevant, not promotional. It would be super easy just to bang out email after email after email, begging, begging for money. Um, but just pushing the fact that you've got a Patreon site. Um, it, Limit those until you've got something in particular to offer. So if it's, um, the, is there anybody from True Crime, that from um, They Walk Among Us? Not on here. Okay, so they did, um, they did, a really, they had a really good marketing strategy. It was about, it was at the beginning of this year and they'd linked up with ITV to cover the um, Whitechapel murders, was it Whitechapel? The, the Bamba, yeah, mm. they took over the Bamba murders. And um, before it went onto TV, they released their first episode of their podcast just on their, on their regular stream. You couldn't get access to the second and third without joining Patreon. The second episode lined up with the first TV episode of the Bamba case. But because people are nosy, and they want to know the story before it goes on TV so they can sit in their living room showing the partner how clever they are that they know all this information. Um, their um, Patreon subscribers double trebled overnight because people wanted that information before it went on TV. So if you're releasing something onto your, it doesn't have to be on Patreon, it can just be on your general site. Patreon's better because that's where you can get the money from. But if you're releasing something that is exclusive, then and it's relevant to the time, then um, that's okay. That's not promotional. That's you being relevant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah, be useful again. It ties back to what I was saying. Um, what's happening within the true crime industry? I know that obviously a lot of festivals got cancelled, but there's still a lot of stuff going online. What books are coming out? What magazines are people reading? Can you link up with any of these magazines to get a subscriber discount? Um, as long as it's relevant to the true crime industry or current industry, <laughs> um, then people are going to be interested in it. And the last point is every time a subscriber sees you in your inbox, you want them to look forward to reading it. I recently signed up to um, Richard Osman from Pointless, signed up to his newsletter. He's got a book coming out in September called The Thursday Murder Club. And I signed up because he's doing exclusive giveaways and stuff like that. But every single time his email lands in my inbox, I make time to sit and have a cup of coffee and um, read it before I start my day because I know it's going to be interesting, it's entertaining, there's a bit of a quiz on there. Um, I'm prepared to give him my time. And then right at the very end in a little box, he'll put, by the way, you can buy my book here. So he's not over flaunting it, he's filling in the really useful information. And at the very bottom, he's been really clear on what you want to do, but ever so subtle. So he's keeping it relevant, keeping it useful. But I say useful, I think his last one contained he wanted to know who'd put a stripe in a frazzle press, but you know, <laughs> all good fun. Um, and he always does a quiz as well, which you would expect. <laughs> um, okay, now this is one that I really wanted to kind of get under the skin off with you, is repurposing your content. So once you have produced your podcast, do you then, as, apart from sharing it across social media, do you then do anything else with it? No. Sometimes I, I, I make audiograms and stick them on social media and things like that after like the podcast episode's been out. Okay. So um, one of the things when I had my podcast was to uh, always get it transcribed. I use rev.com because it helps the hard of hearing and it costs cents per word, so it's something nearly. Um, I use Wave to transcribe the audio and then create the images using Canva or PicMonkey. All of these are free apart from rev.com, but you only have to pay for the uh, transcript that you obviously get transcribed. Um, and create different images. So for, um, you could do one for your latest episode and change the image that so could be, you could have your blog, your podcast header and a little bit of text about it. You could have a picture from the crime scene or the person involved, so the um, perpetrator rather than the victim um, and use that and see again, see which gets the most traction. But then where else do you share it? Are you in touch with any true crime bloggers? Will they share any of your posts for you? Um, have any of you reached out to any of the true crime magazines and asked them to cover a particular episode or highlight a particular episode that's coming up on your podcast? They will want your content and they won't charge you anything and they won't expect you to advertise. I've been a business magazine editor and right now people are screaming out for content. So uh, the one that I get is uh, Crime Mag UK. Oh, I had a copy. Um, they highlight two or three podcasts, independent podcasts, every single issue, and that comes out monthly. And all you have to do is write in with your description of what your podcast is, what's it about, and a particular story that you're covering, and they will give you that coverage for free. I haven't had anybody that's done it yet, um, so I can't give you, I don't know what the what that translates into listens, but it's a nationwide magazine, so I would imagine it's going to, it's free publicity, isn't it? So it's going to work. Maybe, I don't actually, maybe we should try that with you. Sorry, Catherine, what was that magazine called? Yeah. Any second, I'll get it out of here. Mike? That one. I'm then thinking that one. the sort of magazines that you read. How uh, dare you? Oh, you all know that. I've been knitting weekly. I can't find it now. Yeah, I mean, they have a whole section on crime. Mm -hmm. And they do, they cover. Yeah, they do like um, yeah, so they do like a whole page of 
like podcasts and stuff. Oh, that's one there. But that's um, that's comedians. But they do cover independent ones as well. So it'd be worth just reaching out to the editor. They're on. She's on Twitter, I think. Um, and then using tools such as Canva, PicMonkey, Wave, uh, and Rev.com, as I said, Wave is brilliant. Um, you literally just upload your podcast to that and it transcribes it into Wave sounds. So you can post that onto Instagram. You can use that in your Instagram stories. Um, and it'll just give like a 10, 15 second clip of what the episode's about. So if you just select a little bit from the middle, usually about when the crime happened or just before, to, to kind of build people up to it and then use the link um, in your bio to direct them to your podcast. So just make sure that you're getting everything, everything out of every episode because you've put so much time and effort into it that you want to get as many people to listen to it as you possibly can. So that's just one tip. And Canva or Pick Monkey, has anybody heard of that? Down the bottom, just hey, I, I like Canva, it's really easy to use and it's really yeah, good. It yeah, Canva's just drag and drop, you just upload your image, I'll use one of them. And they've got all the dimensions set up for Facebook, Instagram, even LinkedIn, it's all kind of set up and you just drag and drop. So easy to use. Um, and again, they're all free. Kevin, I'll answer this question. So when we all do an episode, we usually send out the usual standard boring tweets, don't we? Um, yeah. And that tweet seen by what about one percent of our Twitter followers, I guess. Should mm -hmm. we be sending it out much, much more than we do? Yeah, absolutely. So what you should so you should take, I would say maybe um, four different elements of the story. So the opening, the perpetrator, the crime being solved, and perhaps a little bit about the court case, and write a little bit just like one or two sentences about each. Maybe put a different picture against each all with the same link and spread it over because you can spread it over said you has got a, a lot of um, life, life span of a week you can spread it over the four days or every other day and see which gets the most traction and then do the same so you might find that if, if you just post out with pictures they're not particularly effective if you post out with, with a click of audio that might go down better um, so it's, again, it's just about testing and measuring, but the th thing is really is to have a plan. Um, and all I do for that, is, I don't complicate it. I use go a, a Google calendar. I print off the month, maybe three months in advance. I write on the day that the podcast is coming out. I'll write, so that way, so if it's coming out on the Monday, I'll do, okay, publish on the Tuesday, Facebook Wednesday, Twitter Thursday, Instagram Friday, maybe one or two over the weekend. And I'll use a tool either called Hootsuite um, to pre-schedule everything, or um, I'll use the native tool. So Facebook, obviously, you can schedule a post to go there. Twitter, you can now schedule in the app as well. Um, we've never been able to do that before. That's just been rolled out. Um, LinkedIn, I'm not sure, because I don't really use that much anymore. Uh, and Instagram, again, that, because that's more of a real-time thing, Instagram I'd do on the day it was published, I'd make Instagram the first part and then because you can schedule the rest again and then watch the analytics. You've all got Google Analytics, right? You all watch the analytics, yeah? yeah. So you, you, you wouldn't hit everything at the same time then? No, absolutely not. No. Um. No, you don't need it. Because people, pe different people are looking at different times. So for example, if you post out at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, you're going to miss your American audience. If you post out at two o'clock on a Monday afternoon, you're going to get your UK and your American audience, but you'll miss your Australian audience. But if you vary the times throughout the week, then you're going to hit someone at some point somewhere, and it's, it's all going to increase your listens. Would you be putting the same content on each of the social media profiles, or would you tailor for Instagram and Twitter separately to Facebook, for instance? Um, when you say on, the, on, your, on your profile, particularly, so I'm just, I'm just I'm just thinking. Usually, if once an episode's gone out, I'll go on to um, a Buffer and schedule all three, mm. and it's the same content for all for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and they and and, and then they all go out at the same time. Uh, but would you be tailoring it for Instagram, tailoring it for Twitter? So sending out different yeah. images, different spiels, or whatever it is that you're putting with it. 
Yeah, I would. Because Instagram is very image heavy, that was the one, if I was going to be using something like Canva, I would probably spend more time developing and working on my image so that it's more eye-catching and get these people from stroking, stroking, <laughs> from strolling, <laughs> scrolling. Um, um, after I completely forgot what I was saying. Oh yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a new image. So you can stop people from scrolling. Um, Twitter uh, is more a hashtag. It's hashtag driven, more so than Instagram, believe it or not. So Twitter, I would spend more time, less time on the image. Yes, a little image, definitely. Our GIF actually GIFs work better on on Twitter, but I don't think you can schedule them. Um, but um, yeah, I'd spend more time developing new hashtags and looking to see what hashtag you need to use. Um, no, you, you say that, Catherine. I'm, I, I'm really slow. I just always put true crime and true crime podcast. That's what I put in my Twitter yeah. hashtags. I don't know if the other guys do the same or different. There are, certain ones different that that hit, there are certain ones that you can hit that will have automatic retweets on. Yeah. So you could right. put Pod Nation and they will retweet you. Indie you'll get a retweet from like the indie groups so there are certain ones that you can hit that you'll get automatic retweets on mm. yeah i mean so yeah uk uk true crime true crime podcast podcast podcasters podcasters live crime um writing community is always a good one because of crime writers we all listen to podcasts um as a way of research um uh, I think again, they're kind of the top ones that spring to mind. Um, are you? I mean, it, what do you mean? Uh, Mike, what, 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 what Twitter you hashtags do you use? Sorry, I'm just asking Mike because he does a lot of Twitter. What what hashtags do you use? Um, I, I I tend to use a lot of the same, but what I've realised recently is that place names seem to be really good. Like, yeah, I, if it, I I've started making sure that I always put a town in because I think a lot of people are geared up to retweet their town so that seems to work yeah absolutely and also also always include hashtag crime watch UK oh right really Ken Paul's not on this podcast really because you know, <laughs> UK the music lined up everything <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah you'd be amazed how many people um watch it and also um Again, this, this goes back to being relevant, really. So if you, if you know you've covered or are going to cover a, a crime that's happened or has recently happened, say, within the last five years, um, include um, the police, the whatever constabulary were involved with it as well. So hashtag West Georgia Police, um, because they, they'll tend to retweet it. Obviously, if it were a case, they won't. <laughs> Not if they got slated over it. But uh, yeah, they will. They do tend to retweet it because it's singing their praises. So why wouldn't they? Okay. Does that give you a few ideas about to reuse your content? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Good stuff. Have I mentioned? Did I mention um, crime bloggers in there? There is a there is a whole army of um, people out there that have de de dedicated true crime blogs that will cover do a review of your podcast for you. So that's another market that if you haven't tapped into it, you could do there worldwide as well. Um, for some reason, Australians are fascinated with UK true crime. Right, okay. So, yeah, think about the customer journey. So again, um, what, what is going to make people, what is going to make um, your potential supporters buy from you? And it's not always based on price. Um, it could be based on um, the uniqueness of the stories that you tell. It could be based on you as a person. Um, I'm a big fan of building no like and trust um, and taking people on that journey so that when they see your inbox, when they see you land in their inbox, it's, oh, hi, old friend. It's how much, how much side you Rich Osman. Like, oh, hello, he's here again. And that's the kind of feeling that you want to be generating so that you're not just a Facebook page or a Facebook group. You're somebody that they feel connected with. Uh, and you do that by building that know, like, and trust. So if you say you're going to send a podcast, uh, sorry, if you say you're going to send a newsletter out every two weeks, you send that newsletter out every two weeks because they will then learn to rely on it. But you'll know that from doing your podcast because most of you um, publish on the same day every week or every month or every fortnight. And it's that that builds up your, your following and your listeners. 
So it's very much the same for the email. So if you've got um, a podcast going out on the Tuesday, then you should be emailing on the either on the Sunday night or the Monday morning, just to remind people to listen. Um, and when the book, oh yeah, right, I remember that. Yeah, I remember to pick up tomorrow when I go on my government approved walk. Um, so some top tips for filling your content, for writing email content, because this is sometimes where people get a little bit stuck. Um, so tell a story. So make it uh, int intriguing, interesting, or inspiring. So this could be how you got into podcasting, why you're into true crime, what is it that you like about it, um, something you love could be another um, podcast. I know um, when I first started listening to Paul, maybe 18 months ago, he always used to um, introduce me to another podcast and they'd come on and say like a couple of minutes about it. Um, and I really enjoyed that because it kind of opened up the field of what I was listening to. In fact, Adam, I think that's how I found your podcast. Um, but what you're doing then is you're tapping into their audience, which is somewhere they may never have even heard of you. Um, something that annoys you, a topic or a book fair. I'm not going to say any because I don't want to put anything off, but there are certain things that pop up in the group from time to time that drive us insane. Um, and if you could put that in a newsletter in a polite way, that would be really good. Um, a time that you screwed up. So, I don't know, doing a webinar whilst you've been pissed. I'm not sure. Um, but it makes you more relatable and believable. Um, because the people then see you as one, you know. People love podcasters very much on a pedestal. I don't know if you appreciate this, but they, they think that you know you've got all this knowledge and you're amazing at what you do, and they do hold you on a pedestal. And the point of this is to kind of say, I'm, you know, I'm just like you. I'm sat in my spare room. I've literally got a crappy microphone, and I'm just making it up as I go along. Basically, people can relate to that, and they want to relate to that. Um, and then a time you, a time you struggle. Um, and then a, a time you struggled. So let everybody know that you failed once. I, um, I've shared a few. I've shared a few. There was one time I did um, a webinar like this. I'd not connected my camera. Nobody had told me, um, and nobody could see me, and they couldn't see my screen, but they could hear me talking. And not one person came and said anything. Um, and then there was another time I released a course uh, on digital marketing. I put a link in. <laughs> didn't, didn't understand why I had no sales. There was no link. <laughs> and then when I did put a link in, it was broken. <laughs> Can we say? <laughs> Greg James has a thing on his radio show called That Time You Wish It. And I've got so many, I would honestly spend an hour of his show just filling in with that. Anyway, moving on. Some subject, subject lines that increase open rates. Um, so yeah, the curiosity trigger. I have to know more. You have to tell me more. Um, so it could be something, um, I know, I, I'm just pulling this out here, but I know who the real Jack Wolf is. You know, people are desperate to know, they want to know more. They would click that because they want to know more. Continuity, and this is a good one. So if you set it up in your previous email, um, and it could be something like, I've got an exclusive episode, but I'll sh I'll, I've got something to share with you. Watch it, watch out for it in the next email. Tell them that it's coming in two days. Believe it or not, people will wait for that email and they will want to know what it is that you're sharing. And it could be anything. It could be a free Patreon membership. It could be a t-shirt. It could be a giveaway, a competition, anything like that. But what you're doing is setting them up. Um, and then the chemistry. So use your personality speak directly to your subscribers so don't be afraid to be what's and all and let a little bit of yourself creep in there as well but what's what's everyone's thoughts on that because I, I i do that and i think i probably do it too much because i get criticized all the time for being too personal and you yeah. see guys like pace file and they walk among us just personally much as i respect them as podcasters i can't stand either show because i just find it really boring well, they're more like audio books. They're everyone else's views. How much do you talk about? Hmm? They're more like audio books, though, those, those, those shows. Whereas, yeah. at least with your, your sort of shows, I can laugh out loud and look like a complete loon in the street. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I agree. It's Sarah. different. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think because um, you make it personal and you, you know, um, 
you're not you you're not afraid to show what's and all. And for me, that's if you would, if we were to sit in a cafe, we would know that because we've met face to face. It shouldn't be any different just because you're doing it online. I don't mm. think so anyway. And it endears people to you as well, Adam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 oh, <it's> so popular. <laughs> from your toes. It's interesting. Isn't it? It's really interesting about the personality. Um, how much you bring into it, Bob? Do you, what do you think about that? Do you bring much of you to, to the podcast? Well, my my kind of strapline to the podcast is I don't do facts and figures really well, but I like telling a story. So that's yeah. what you're getting when I'm telling you the story is my opinion of the facts and figures and my taking of it. So I think if I was to write an email or it would have to go that way because I don't really know how else to do it. Because mm. yeah. um, uh, and I, I did an interview with um, Kate that does Ignorance Was Bliss um, oh, yeah. over in America, and she basically had said she feels there's two types of true crime podcasts. There's ones that will give you the facts and the figures, and the other there's another one that will tell you a really good story. Um, which one did I feel in? I fell into, and I went, well, yeah, I don't know the facts and figures, so it has to be the other one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I I would say that if you can chuck personality in there, that that's what that's what people are coming for. If people come yeah, back exactly. a second time, then that's why they're there, surely. Yeah, mm. uh, it's that individuality, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's some shows that I totally I do like, but I can't stand the personality. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, True Crime Garage comes to mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. One one of them I can't stand. The other one he tells a great story, fantastic the way he delivers. But the other one, complete knob, really and truly, don't like him. And that Sorry. was listening, wasn't it? Captain. Captain. He's the captain. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the one. Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in trouble if you don't like complete knobs. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're in good oh, company. I, I can tolerate, but yeah, a complete one. Oh no. <laughs> um, okay, so there's, there's two kinds of email sequences that I'm going to talk about now. The first one is um, a welcome sequence. So um, you've gone into MailerLite, you've created an initial email for people to sign up. After that, they then get the first email which says welcome and thank you that's all it is it's just hi maybe you know your uh, your, your brand logo at the top welcome and thank you for joining um great to have you here and then your social media links at the bottom the second email which is a couple of days later what to expect have you connected with me on social yet if you have and i've tried this before and it works really well use this hashtag so hi adam or hi uk true crime or something so that if somebody else read the newsletter and they, they, they then go connect with you on twitter you know where they've got your um your twitter handle from another way of testing and measuring and then the third email is where you really welcome them in what would you like to hear so are there any stories that you want me to cover is there anything in particular that you want me to talk about either on patreon in the general podcast or in my newsletter um, and you know, even even to the point where you remember I said before, you have to tell people what you want them to do. Even to the point where you say, you know, don't be shy. Honestly, if you email this email address, I will answer because people tend not to. But if you tell them that it's okay, and I've done this with a few podcasts actually, um, and I tend to get an answer back saying, yeah, that'll be covered in week three, or yeah, that'll we've already done that in episode twelve or whatever it was. Um, and then going back to what I said before, commit to standing out after you've done the welcome sequence, commit to sending out an email um, once a fortnight, but test and measure. If once a fortnight is you feel it's too much, make it once a month. Once a month feels it's too much, make it every six weeks. What You find what works for you and for your readers. There is no one size fits all. Because if you do too much, you're gonna lose subscribers. If you do too little, you're not gonna see a big return. So it's all, it's all about testing and measuring and you finding your own route. Um, and then same time, same day, same time until you establish the rest of open rates. So initially, um, we, like I said before, do it over a period of time and then vary to see as you get what, what open rates you can Yeah. 
uh, okay, so then there is um, an, a nurturing sequence. So this is kind of stepping on a little bit from the open sequence there. So this could be this could be in your general newsletter, um, but include these things as well. So we've covered more than one topic. So welcome to the community, invite them to the Facebook group if you have one. And uh, so thank you for that exclusive behind the scenes access. Adam, I loved that that you did on um, Patreon just before you did your YouTube live when you showed the little toy phone set up um, as your studio. I yeah, thought that was brilliant. It was inspired, wasn't it? Inspired, yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, but if you use, if, if, if that kind of thing, exclusive behind the scenes, do that versus the real thing, and, and it's that kind of thing. Um, and then where to find out more, do you need any help connect again? So you're always, always there, you're there kind of everywhere they turn. And then leave it a few days. Um, and this is where you do your, ups, your upsell. This is where you say, okay, so if you caught up on all the back episodes, if you want some exclusive episodes, let me introduce you to Patreon. You can introduce Patreon before this if you feel confident, if, you, if you've been getting a really good open rate. I'd say if your open rate's above 30%, then you're doing, brilliantly well um, and you can introduce Patreon before that it's, again it's individual it's down to what you feel and these are just a few ideas as to kind of what's worked for me in the past. Catherine does um, Mailer Light give you your open rates in their in, yeah. yeah so you would in a second yeah I'll show you in a sec um, right make them stand out and get opened so include the pain point in the subject line um, add more value by suggesting further tips so, uh, so how to get signed, how easy it is to sign up with Patreon, one, two, three, that's it, you're done. Obviously invite them to connect with you on social. When you're sending out your email, personalise with your first name if you can, but not on every opportunity because it just looks repetitive and will be boring. And then I come back to tell them what you want them to do next. So I click this link to join Patreon with big flashing neon signs going down to it. Okay, so this is kind of, so this is the sales funnel, um, which I'm just gonna briefly talk you through, is I put free download opt-in. Probably because when I started doing this, it was always kind of, if you want to learn how to use Twitter, then this free download, and that was my way of getting uh, an email address. Um, you could do it as if you want a free exclusive episode, sign up here, and you can give them one of your Patreon. Um, episodes. So what you're doing is you're not giving everything away, you are only solving 20% of the pain point and they're going to get the rest from you. So 20% is maybe one episode of Patreon, 80% they're going to pay for. So you're giving to gain. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then uh, in the next email again, as they come down the funnel, you're, you're adding extra value. So you're setting yourself up as an expert, maybe sharing with them a time where um, you've either spoke to a, I don't know, you've, you've spoke to a criminal lawyer or you've met Judge Rinder or something that adds value um, that's going to want them to open the next email that comes from you. And then if you put at the bottom of something amazing for you, keep an eye on your inbox. Again, it could be a competition, you could have some free books to give away. Um, it could be that you are going to run a YouTube channel with the sole intent of inviting them to Patreon, you reducing the prices for a limited number of time, give away to gain more. Um, instill FOMO, so fear of missing out. So this is what these are the episodes that we've got coming up. You know, um, there's the Dennis, is it Dennis Nielsen? I think it's going to be serialised on TV soon. So that could be a good one to jump in on if you haven't already um, covered that one. Um, I don't know, you just think of some exclusives that you can do around that. And then just before, put a deadline on it so it's got a ticking clock. So for this next week, I'm giving, you know, three Patreon members away free. For the three that you give away, you're six that sign up because they've got FOMO. They're not, they don't want to miss out. Um, so that's kind of, that's how you take them through the funnel. It's all about building no like and trust, being consistent, testing and measuring, and making sure that you are preparing them at some point that they're going to have to part with some money. Yeah. Okay, so here's my upsell. <laughs> um, 
I've written a book on this. Um, it's called Digital Marketing Made Easy. It's on Kindle now. If you're on Kindle Unlimited, it's free, although it was not nice a pound. Um, I've updated it, um, so please feel free to go join it. And then I have just a small favour to ask. I've recently launched, um, as well as doing all this, I'm a crime writer through um, psychological thrillers, and I've got my first book coming out, hopefully, in October. Ooh. I can check out um, my Facebook author profile, and I've not got one person yet that's liked it. And I thought I'd maybe ask you guys if you would like to pop over there and like it first. That would be amazing. Of course, we can think. Right, are you ready to jump into my mail the light? Have we also got time? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me change my screen over. No, oh, I don't want to stop sharing. There we go. Dashboard. Can you see that? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is MailerLite. So this is what happens when you first go in. This is the dashboard that you see. Now, again, this is for my author site, so I've only just set it up. That one recipient is me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be pushing this over the next few weeks. Um, so how I, I, what I'd like to do is just quickly talk you through how I'm going to work it, and then you can take from it however that fits in with your, with your way of working. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So when you jump into MailerLite, again, it's free for up to um, a thousand subscribers, twelve thousand emails a month. Unless I get signed by a major publishing house, I am not going to hit that any time in the next twelve months. So I know I'm going to be comfortable on this for a while. However, I do have some subscribers already on an old Mailchimp account. So if I wanted to import them, this is where I would do it by just adding subscribers. Okay, I'll come back to that. On this dashboard, it gives you everything that you need to know. So it tells you all your, your subscribers that you've added up, that you've added to your list, your subscriber growth, your monthly campaign stats. So it tells you opened, clicked, unsubscribed and complaints. Um, really, that's the basics that you need to know. And then the number of signups that you've had per month. Right, then we go on to campaigns. So every time you set up a campaign, whether it's just a straightforward, hi, thanks for signing, or whether it's a, um, here you go, here's the free thing I told you about, everything will go into here. And to create a campaign is super simple. I'm not gonna talk you through it because I'll be here all night, but it's literally, if you're going to create a campaign, it's drag and drop and it's super easy. It's like using a bit like using Canva. Um, play around with it and they've got loads and loads of templates that you can use as well so I'll show you um, this one so this is in my well, it's in my website it's on my Facebook page and um, I'll be posting it through Twitter and um, everywhere else um, and it gives you the full breakdown so you can see again the region environment whether it's mobile web or desktop which is super important because you want to know you want to make sure that it works on all those platforms it tells you which links have been clicked again super important so you know what content people are looking to read and then if we have a look at the email itself okay so this is taken from um can y'all see that okay mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is just, all I did is I've used a stock image that was already in MailerLite. Hello, thank you for joining me. I've signed up. Um, I've just changed some text. Signed up to receiving frequent ad hoc and random emails from me as an indie author. In the meantime, take a look around the website. I'm telling people what I want them to do. Read short stories and later blog posts. That's it for now. See you soon. It's all I want people to do right now is do that is just to get to know me i'm building that know like and trust it's really simple i've not overwhelmed them they don't have to do they have to do anything at all if they don't want but if they've signed up then they wouldn't want a really good short story maybe uh, and obviously there's my social media links at the bottom as well that is a really simple email sign up yeah and then what i've got 
go back here. I have um, another sign up farm on my website. That one's from Facebook, this one's from my website. And this gives people the chance to have a sneak peek of the book that's coming out. Um, so I've put in the blurb and I've put in also download free chapters. So if people click that button, they will receive a PDF of the first three chapters of my book. That then goes into an um, email sequence what did you think? I'd love your feedback. Would you leave me a review? So I'm planning, I'm self-publishing this book. I'm planning to do that in October, but I'm already sowing the seeds now because I know how long it takes to build an email list. But what I hope to have done is by the middle of September is to have at least 10 independent reviews so that I've got an audience there waiting for that book when it comes out. So I've got people talking about it. I've created a bit of noise. I've built no like, no like and trust with my audience by communicating with them in by email um, and hopefully when they've got the free chapters they'll want to know even more that they'll go buy the book yeah that all making sense mm -hmm. okay so that's that's you, that's how you do your campaigns subscribers as I said before if you've already got a subscriber list on MailChimp it's super easy to impart it's just add subscribers when people sign up they'll appear, appear here so as you can see obviously they're in my email address in at the moment do you remember I talked about segmenting and putting people into different groups? So this is where you would choose your, choose your groups. Again, this comes to when you set up your form, you, it, um, MailerLite will ask you what group you want these subscribers assigned to. So if I was, um, so I, I, let's say I've got three books already published and I've got book one, book two and book three, I would create a different group and then only talk to the subscribers about that particular book or that particular segment until the second book came out or the third book came out or on book two and three I would say have you read book one do you see what I mean so that you they know that you intuitively know what book it is that they've already bought yeah that making sense you don't give over the job of explaining that I don't think I know what I mean <laughs> um Farms, again, you know those horrible, annoying pop-up farms that come up on your computer? You can create them in here as well. Again, it's super simple. Um, sites is just your websites that you're um, connected to. And then automation workflow. This can get a little bit complicated. I'm just really wary of time, so I'm not going to stay long in here. So, all you do for this, once you have created a um, a welcome sequence you then can create steps that go on from that and you can dictate exactly how that next email is triggered so it can be done when a subscriber joins a different group when this when they subscribe subscriber completes a form which is probably the one that you will use most so we're just going to go for that one at the minute so if i select i have got form so so if we selected a form and then down here you would say send after three days, send after four days, send after five days and that email would then automatically be sent out and you don't need to do anything other than go back and check the results that you've had. So if you, if like Adam, your, your podcast comes out every Tuesday, you can set up an automated flow for the latest episode to be published. Your latest episode is going to be published on Tuesday. People have signed up to this group every Monday night at seven o'clock, they'll get a reminder. So it may take a lot of work up front, but actually the end result is going to save you a massive amount of time. Yeah. Let's just go out of that. I'm just really aware at times it's five past five now. Um, and of course, then you can upgrade. Now, when you first signed up for MailerLite, if you um if you've never signed up for it before, you get the first two weeks of the professional, the, the upgrade free. I would say take it, make sure you, it doesn't automatically get taken out of your account after the two weeks. They come and ask you if you want to upgrade or not. But take it because you can have a real play around with it then and see if it's worth upgrading. If you don't think you're going to get 1,000 subscribers and send 12,000 emails within the first year, then I wouldn't bother. But if you think you're going to go over that, then it's definitely, I would say it's worth the investment. It's about $9 a month or something. It's not super expensive. Okay. Any questions? No.
Oh. I've blown all your minds now because you're very quiet. <laughs> It was all really interesting, thank you. Okay, cool. Right, well, that's it from me then. If there are no questions, like I said, there's the, um, if you like my off page, that would be fun. Great, we're well, to watch Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and conference. if you think of any questions, you just mm. put them in the group, or if you, you set anything up and you're not sure, or if you think, if you just want to have a quick check of anything, then just put it in the, the messenger group, and I'm more than happy to help out where I can, because I think, the work that you guys do really do just need recognising. So if I can help you in any way, then I definitely will. Thank you very much. All right. I need to get Twitter now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. No worries. No worries at all. Thank you. Right. I shall speak to you all later. Yes. Thank Bye. you. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye. Bye. Oh, Mike. Oh. Looking at you. <laughs>